Thanks for coming, everyone. And uh, as Maya Halani mentioned, um, a lot of the work I do is um, kind of, we call it a blue water open ocean um, oceanography. So we go um, pretty far away from shore, a uh, thousand miles or something like that or more. Though I do do a lot of work right around the main Hawaiian Islands and the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. But tonight I'll be talking about some work around Johnson Atoll and the Marine Monument there. Um, so that kind of doesn't get a lot of uh, a lot of attention compared to Hawaii and some of the other um, Papa and Almo Kulakea, the Northwestern Islands, that kind of thing. Um, so this is a kind of a series of cruises over the past three or four years, um, and I was on involved in a couple of them. And um, for, so to kind of explain the uh, the title of the talk that was advertised, a map on the floor. So that was um, a cruise on the Schmidt Ocean Institute. Um, um, ship um, research vessel Falcor. So the Schmidt Ocean Institute is a uh, is a private foundation, and um, they sponsor uh, research um, by uh, submitting proposals, much the way the National Science Foundation and NOAA work. Um, so they one of the things they do is they have besides doing the science and sponsoring the science, they uh, sponsor a, an artist at sea. Uh, if you have space on, on your ship, if you have enough berths um, to take them. And they work in different media. So it's just another outreach uh, way, um, thing that they do. So the, the artist on, on my cruise um, to Johnson Atoll area was an adventure cartoonist. And she, um, she does uh, tall, she actually sails on um, tall ships and she uh, does cartoons of various sorts. And um, so she put together this basically a science comic book and there's some over there by the cookies uh, you're welcome to take one um, and uh, it explains uh, more of what we did and some more of the technology and in, in a very kind of uh, easy layman type of thing and the other one and the, uh, the, the forest of the weird this was uh, these are a couple of cruises they had actually three or four cruises to the Johnson Atoll area um, between 2015 and 2017 and um, that was with uh, the, the ship Okeanos Explorer, and they did uh, seafloor mapping, and they did also uh, ROV, or uh, remotely operated vehicle. What does HURL stand for? That is uh, Hawaii Undersea Research Lab at the University of Hawaii. So we um, had been, we um, have uh, the deep sea uh, submersibles, uh, Pisces 4 and 5, and they're out um, at the uh, Makai Pier over by Sea Life Park. Oh, thank you. And um, so this is this other cruise with the NOAA ship was uh, doing ROV work, and so they made a series of videos, and I'll show you one of those at the uh, end of the end of the talk. So um, just to uh, explain what I'm going to show you, so I'm going to show you a lot of uh, the regular science and maps and so on, but I'll add some of the illustrations from Lucy Bellwood, that's the cartoonist, uh, during the talk, and just to uh, Kind of go back in time a little that's kind of in the in the days of yore and the sailing ships and other expeditions and land expeditions they uh, illustrated a lot of the uh, scenes um, on the cruise because they didn't have cameras and then when they did have cameras they weren't uh, mobile cameras like your gopros and iphones and stuff they use uh, you know photo sheets and um, photo plates and uh, chemicals and things so they had illustrators they had artists on board the scientists and uh, other crew actually did some of the uh, illustrations. So anyway, this uh, is kind of a modern take on that, what I'll be showing you a little bit. So the outline here, um, talk about the geological setting of uh, the Johnson Atoll area. Uh, some of the interesting history of uh, Johnson Atoll, if for those of you who have been here for a few decades, will probably remember some of the uh, 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 chemical munitions disposal um, activity that went on there. And then before that, there was a lot of other um, military and um, some CIA activity and a lot of kind of weird stuff that happened there. Uh, it's basically cleaned up and nobody lives there anymore. Um, so talk about seafloor mapping, what we do there. Uh, talk about uh, what we do with ROV and other type of uh, dives to go look at the bottom in detail. And then uh, if we have time, we'll get into some marine mining concerns uh, and recommendations that we've come up. and. Um, and show you some uh, results from the uh, dives down there. So uh, to locate you, the Johnson Atoll is, uh, here we are over on Oahu, 700 miles to the west, southwest. Uh, this is it, it's um, a uh, small flat island. Um, basically uh, over here is the illustration, it looks kind of like an aircraft carrier actually. Um, it's been modified heavily by, um, by uh, the military. <laughs> over the years. 
Um, the older reserve area was a bird reserve, actually, is this kind of this purple magenta box about that size. It's about a 50 mile, um, I think this is about a 50 mile square box. Um, and then some years ago, it was actually expanded to the full 200 mile radius uh, exclusive economic zone. So that's the full um, territory claimed by the, the United States um, as our uh, sovereign territory. And we are able to um, basically um, uh, control how the resources in that area are managed. So um, just a geological setting of this. So we have uh, the mainland the continent over here, the Hawaiian chain up here, over here, kind of in a uh, crude fashion. And the uh, Line Islands chain is in here. So the Johnson Atoll area is part of the Line Islands. And those go all the way down into the South Pacific to the Cooks, uh, to Amatu chains, Marquesas. Um, and uh, it's kind of a, um, it's a, it's a whole bunch of seamounts, basically, underwater mountains. And it's, but it's very confusing. It's, uh, there's not been a lot of work uh, done there compared to the Hawaiian Islands, but um, it's a northwest trending chain of atolls, submarine ridges, seamounts. Um, and there's two, um, the, the, it's about 4,000 kilometers long. So about, um, about uh, 2,000 miles or so. Um, and it's um, located on old seafloor. It's um, about in the range of 80 to 100 some million years old. And that was formed at the, down in the South Pacific and the East Pacific rise and has moved up uh, with plate tectonics to the uh, Northwest. Yes? So that's uh, Cretaceous is the period, um, it's a time period, it's like so um, lasting in the range of this 120 to 183 million years ago. So it's uh, kind of like Jurassic Park, it's another time yeah. period from long ago. So the yeah. Jurassic, Triassic, Cretaceous. So Cretaceous is a little newer than Jurassic. Um, so some of the um, Geochronology, which is the age of this, uh, the age of the rocks. Okay, so again, I, we're up here at Johnson Atoll, Hawaii's over here, up in this corner, down at the very end, uh, Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll down here, which you might have heard of, and the Line Islands um, are up in here, with um, um, extending up into here with Johnson Atoll. So there's kind of two sides of volcanism. Um, so instead of having the more simplistic kind of hotspot theory of Hawaii, where you have one hotspot plume and that's making these seamounts uh, and islands, there, there were two that were active over long periods of time um, based on work from other people, not myself, that have studied the rock chemistry and the rock ages. Um, so basically it's um, kind of a um, difficult, uh, kind of a confusing place. They don't match the, the, uh, the observations of the uh, rocks chemistry in the rock ages don't really match with just a single or multiple hotspots. So they kind of think that there are a lot of structural cracks and fissures and um, weaknesses in the sea floor that allowed the magma to erupt as lava and create these seamounts over time. Um, so this is a um, blow up basically of the exclusive economic zone. So the, 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 two, the 400 mile diameter um, a circle around Johnson Atoll, which is in the center, and the one. That's not good. I guess we need to leave. I'll go get my nail. Yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah. There we go. I guess they got some. Magic. All right. So this this uh, red box is one of the the study areas of the uh, Falcor crews. We. Um, um, Basically, there's a lot of uh, strange rocks, uh, different rock types uh, collected over the many decades of study, um, um, different ranges of composition. Okay, that's what we, we're about to evacuate. But <laughs> um, 
So there's um, a lot of, uh, so like, as I mentioned earlier about the, um, the different, the cracking in the crust is maybe allowing some of these seamounts to come up and explains the kind of the overlapping nature of them that they don't really follow us, uh, uh, like a Hawaiian style order of getting older in one direction. Yes. There was another word, synchromotion. Synchronous. Was before this. Um, yeah. So the um, the law the the um, <clears throat> these seamounts uh, in the lava erupted uh, over a wide range instead of just like one island, like like say um, the big the big island kind of erupting and those uh, at one time in one place uh, in forming one island. That all the a lot of these features were being erupted over uh, big uh, um, gaps of, of uh, big ranges, like um, like hundreds of miles at a time. Um, and so that's why they think there were these cracks in the, in the, in the crust. Yeah, I tried to um, tone it down, <laughs> but it was hard to find synonyms. Uh, so I meant to explain that. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, I couldn't find a really good word that, that didn't confuse it more. Um, so these, th this area, these, uh, this area that we're studying in here was these are there were some dates at 67.6 million years old um, from previous studies. Um, so, and as far as the biology, so we'll kind of get out of the geology part right now. Um, it's also significant um, because of the um, we we've seen that it has these high density deep sea coral and sponge communities that uh, that are really focused on certain parts of the seamounts. Um, there's, um, it, it, it's regarded, the Johnson Atoll area is regarded as a stepping stone. So these, there, here's the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, the Papa Hanamokuake on the main islands of Hawaii, and then Johnson Atoll here. So they're fairly close compared to other marine monuments in the Pacific. Um, but it may be a, um, a stepping stone for uh, organisms going both way and also an outpost as far south as they've gone. Um, so it, th they do have these, um, pristine ecosystems. It hasn't been a lot of interaction other than what was done on the actual atoll itself at Johnson Atoll. And, and not a lot of exploration has happened there um, because it's such a remote and kind of wide, uh, big, large area. All right, so switch gears a little bit. This is a um, history of the atoll. And these are the, this is just an overhead shot of the main uh, island. So this is Johnson Atoll. It's really not a parking lot or an aircraft carrier, but it's been, as I said, been modified. And then it has some other islands that are also mostly, I think these are all man-made. Um, so um, I'll, I won't go and read all these, but I'll just kind of highlight it. So as far as we know, there are no indigenous peoples that were ever there and never colonized that was visited, um, apparently. Um, 1796, uh, it was discovered by Westerners. Um, by an American captain, he did not uh, name it or claim it. Um, perhaps he was embarrassed for running aground, um, but that's how a lot of these, these uh, places get named. So I asked the captains of our ships if you would like me to name a propose a name of a feature after you, and they say no because <laughs> they don't want to have that uh, idea uh, attached to them. But anyway, the the British came 1807. They they found it and. Uh, um, Captain Charles Johnson names it after himself. Um, then uh, in the range of 1856 to 1893, there was this interesting back and forth between the United States and the Kingdom of Hawaii, uh, claiming it and, and, um, and the other one. So they were like um, chartering ships back and forth and they'd go down there and plant a flag for Kingdom of Hawaii and then the US one would come down and take their flag and plant the US one. This went back and forth for a little while. It's kind of strange. Uh, and then, I guess because of the overthrow of the um, Hawaiian Kingdom, it kind of ended right there in 1893. So then it became a U.S. territory. Um, uh, bird guano mining was uh, carried out there as with a lot of uh, remote islands in the Pacific. Um, then a few other things. The 1923 was first um, really modern uh, expedition. The Tanager was a um, U.S. Um, minesweeper, I believe. And there were a lot of scientists from um, Hawaii and other places that were involved in these surveys of all these remote islands. Uh, it was declared a bird refuge, 1926. So kind of the, some of the uh, oddball stuff that happened there. Um, as you might expect, it was declared a kind of a 
So they became coral blasting. It was declared a naval defense area. This is pre, um, right before World War II. Um, it was actually shelled by a Japanese submarine uh, during um, the attacks that happened around the Pacific, with along with uh, coincident with Pearl Harbor. Um, became a navigation station for the Coast Guard, and then um, kind of all the strange things started happening. Um, nuclear weapon test site, spy satellite um, um, recoveries, um, anti-satellite missile programs, some biological warfare testing in the 60s, chemical weapon and storage, um, and uh, Agent Orange storage, that's the defoliant. Um, they used a lot in uh, uh, Vietnam and other places. Uh, and then there was a chemical weapon incinerator basically built there that was uh, probably some of you remember that 1990 to 2000 that was going and then they uh, basically um, disposed of the uh, disposal system and uh, basically um, removed it all and then by 2003-2004 it was uh, closed down and basically nobody's there anymore except researchers that go there occasionally. So the growth of the island, so 1942 was just this kind of brownish area here. Um, then it was being dredged and kept being expanded. So really kind of between 62 and 64, it really got quite a bit larger by just dredging stuff up and artificially uh, enhancing it. Um, these are some shots of it um, from the air. Uh, the, main, the main Johnson Atoll Island is in the left and Sand Island to the right. And, Again, this is a, there's a, I don't know if you can see it, there's a uh, antenna here for the uh, Loran, which is a radio, uh, radio navigation system that was used quite a bit um, before uh, GPS, modern GPS. And then uh, some of these uh, bad accidents there, this is one where a missile uh, exploded on the, on the deck there and kind of contaminated it all. It had uh, some um, nuclear um, elements in it. And um, so it's not a real great. Hey, let me ask you a question. Sure. On the Thor missile that had exploded. Uh huh. Was the Thor missile the same Navy missile that I saw on TV when they said they were going to shoot the American satellite up in 1957 or something? Probably was. What? Yeah. Well, then I I don't know, but for sure, but it probably was. I think that was. It failed. Yeah. And then Von Braun got his chance to put his up. Okay. So I was just wondering, the Thor missile doesn't have a good record. <laughs> so, yeah. So this, um, and then this is a, a shot. It's not a very great shot. It's a little low res. But these are, this is a, the, low, the Agent Orange barrels that uh, were there. And this is a, a forklift for scale. And then these, each one of these is a, one of the barrels stretched out on the, uh, on the, on the top of the feature there. Um, and... Uh, then the, whatever I read said that they were mostly, a lot of them were leaking. And then this is the actual, the incinerator where they got rid of all like the nerve gas and all this stuff. Um, and kind of when it was in its prime, I guess in the 1990 to 2000 era. Um, oh yeah, and this is a reminder. So um, I got back from this cruise to there and I had my dog at the, um, at her vet, veterinarian. And um, she's about my age, and she said, oh, yeah, I was telling her about this. And she says, oh, I, I was in the military early in my career as a veterinarian, so I guess she's a vet. vet. But um, she, uh, she said, oh, they used to send me all over the place um, to, go, she, uh, to go deal with the military animals that they use, you know, dogs and stuff. She said, they sent me to Johnson Atoll to take care of the rabbits. And I said, what do you mean, the rabbits? And she said, they had these pens of rabbits around the island, like next to this facility and so on. So instead of, you know, the mine canaries, they used to use canaries down in coal mines and other mines to detect get poison gas and then the canary dies, then you're next. So they had rabbits and I guess if they got exposed to the bad, worse stuff, the rabbits would be So anyway, <laughs> so she had to go there for like a week because they only had one flight in and out for a regular schedule and they had to actually shut down their production because she was the only female and that and she was of um, childbearing age and they didn't want to have you know any potential symptoms so it was kind of an interesting story which I didn't read anywhere else <laughs> so um, some later scientific work uh, at the, the Hurl lab that I mentioned earlier um, we did some submersible dyes there in the early 80s that was before I was around involved um, and then um, the U.S. Geological Survey did um, uh, 
a low resolution wide swath sonar survey of the entire uh, 200 mile radius EEZ. And then there was more high resolution mapping done by the NOAA, um, NOAA local NOAA group in the uh, 2006 era. Yes. What's that? So bathymetry, I get, I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. It's basically the seafloor topography. So it's like uh, topo topographic or elevation maps on land only underwater. Um, this is just a map of the, reef, the kind of the uh, glorious side scan. So it tells us textural information, but it's fairly low resolution. So um, we have better data these days. So I'll talk about that um, soon. So the uh, Oh, so the, in 05, this actually, they put the Johnson Atoll up for sale. Um, I actually saw this advertisement when it went up. And um, so it went up, but this came down pretty quick. It didn't last long, but the, the U.S. was trying to sell it. And uh, so I don't know, um, it's more like not location, location, location. Oh, this way. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, it had places that you couldn't go. They said, if you buy this, you can't go to these certain places on the island or something, something like that. So the modern, some of the modern history, the more, the more happy stuff, uh, it was established by uh, President Obama as, uh, as, um, as a uh, Marine National Monument. Uh, this whole place with other islands like Wake and, and Baker, Howland, Jarvis, John, uh, Johnson Atoll, Kingman Reef, Palmyra. And then it was expanded also by him in 2014 to the full 200 mile uh, um, area. And then it's been managed, it's managed both by NOAA and, or um, NOAA and uh, in, this, in this case with Johnston and Wake, it's managed by the Department of Defense. So um, as far as now the, the work we're doing, uh, some of the, the seafloor mapping we do, we do this multi-beam mapping, which is a, a swath mapping system. So we basically uh, it, the ship emits a, a beam or a swath of sound. We drive along kind of like mowing the lawn back and forth and uh, create a very detailed topographic map. Um, I might try and let the, uh, we, may, we did this, uh, my this son. Ocean Ocean I'll let them explain it. We the Islands, Monument, we'll show you some diagrams. All we see is water, but what else is out there? We know that the ocean floor below us has some topography from satellite data, but it does not give us the whole picture. Seamounts, ridges, and other geological features on the ocean floor can tell us about the area's history and lighthouse unique organisms and high concentrations of deep sea minerals. This area is also considered a stepping stone for Pacific marine species expanding their population. More detailed mapping will help future scientists know where to focus on for research and new discovery. For that, we use our multi-beam. Belmore's multi-beam emits pink, each including 432 beams down towards the ocean floor. Those beams bounce back to the ship's receivers. By measuring how long it takes the pink to bounce back, we can calculate the depth of the ocean. The depth is 2,000 meters! Changes in the angle, intensity, and backscatter of the returning beam also gives us an idea of the shape and composition of the ocean floor. Oh, and check this out. This is the gondola. What's up? It holds the multi-beam transmitter and receiver. It sits well below the keel of the ship so that the bubbles produced by the rocking and rolling of the ship don't affect the data. It doesn't bother me. Other instruments on board carefully keep track of the pitch, roll, and key of the ship and how they affect the pink. As the ship sails along, we are collecting data for a swath of ocean floor about 4,000 meters wide below the ship. This is the control room. Here, scientists process data coming in from the multi-team. I'm not even doing that. Belfort's multi-team system does a great job at providing us with accurate data, but we still have to polish it a bit. We play any outliers from the data set. In the end, we'll have a three-dimensional image of the ocean floor. Wow, check out those seamounts and craters. We will combine this newly discovered data with existing maps to help scientists know where to focus on for future discovery. With the help of Belfort's multi the vast ocean floor is becoming more accessible and we're finding exciting new features to explore further. So, 
So anyway, um, my uh, science team, along with Lucy, the cartoonist, the uh, illustrator, put that together. So um, and we, that was part of our public outreach uh, that we did on the website. So as, a, as they mentioned, we collect two kinds of data. This is the topography or the bathymetry map, false color bathymetry. We colorize it to make your brain um, be able to kind of recognize the high points, the, the hot colors, the red colors, and the deeper parts are the blues and the blues and the purples. And then we also get this backscatter data that they mentioned in the in the little video that's uh, kind of a reflectivity. Yes? Okay, what is bathymetry? That's your to seafloor topography. What? Seafloor topography, the elevation of the seafloor. So how high it is above the bottom. So thank you. So this um, backscatter gives us kind of a textural psycho, like kind of like a um, aerial photo photograph only we use sonar sound waves instead of light waves um, and um, so the cruise that we did we went to started flew over to guam actually it was a uh, they were repositioning the ship in this case to the middle of the pacific and the and the west coast so flew over there we had a 10-day cruise through here and we had uh, about five or six days at johnson atoll and then came back to hawaii so um it's a long long haul across the across the ocean So this is um, this is um, part of the, the comic um, that they did, and uh, these are myself and then uh, two of my able assistants, and then we had a lot of other people that were uh, involved in doing the public outreach on this uh, cruise. So uh, my superpower was I got to uh, submit a proposal to uh, write this to go on this cruise, and um, so off we went. Um, the uh, Johnson Atoll is here in the middle of this. This the low resolution kind of gray stuff is a satellite, low resolution satellite data that they referred to, uh, and then these lines going across are all the higher resolution bathymetry surveys done with this multi beam technology. So we were, we decided to study these seamounts uh, and add to what was already been done um, by others. Um, so these had been unmapped in a modern way. Um, so before we were there, is this is what the area looked like, and afterwards we mapped uh, these seamounts, and then some others that were outside this range. So you can see this low res data. This is kind of the stuff that's in Google Earth. Um, so if you zoom in to just a, you know, Google Earth looks really good if you're kind of pulled out, but if you zoom into a feature uh, in the middle of the sea um, in the ocean, um, this is kind of typically what you're going to see. And then this is the kind of resolution we get with actually being there on a ship with sonar systems. Yes. I've never heard of that. Um, did I show that? <laughs> oh, okay. That's uh, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands Monument, Papa Marine National. The Northwestern Hawaiian Islands beyond Kauai up to oh, Midway and okay. Kirin. I've never heard of that place. Oh, yeah. We work up there quite a bit too. Um, so this. These are just some of the uh, statistics that in this um, one cruise, what we were able to do. Um, maps, uh, six or more seamounts, eight representing eight to 10 individual volcanoes. And um, <clears throat> we kind of laid the, the groundwork for follow-on cruises using the, uh, the diving uh, technologies, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so we named some of these after um, early explorers and ships and scientists. Um, you can propose names to the international naming community. Uh, they're all, all unnamed features. Um, and then the way we go about this as far as the technology, we take the bathymetry, which uh, the seafloor topography. Uh, we also look at the uh, backscatter data, which is the reflectivity of the seafloor. Um, we put all these data together, combine all the different swaths that overlap, um, and then we um, construct the models. We use a software called ArcGIS. It's a geographical information system, and you're able to um, kind of layer all these data sets on top of each other. And then using um, very, whatever tech, uh, you know, whatever data you can do, your own Im impressions, your own knowledge, uh, dive observation samples that were collected or whatever, we, we build these geological maps that are quite detailed. So on the bottom, one is a structural map, so these red lines are like rift zones, uh, structural features, faults, fissures, um, things that crack the earth, basically. Or and then on the right are the uh, these colored, all these little polygons, or these colored outlined areas, are the geological um, 
um, units. So, um, and we came up with about eight different units, and these represent volcanic uh, volcanic cones, um, volcanic flank, uh, debris flank, which is uh, material that falls off, um, plat maybe uh, summit lavas or uh, carbonates like uh, fossil reefs. Um, and what else we have various landslide types, slumps and um, debris avalanche landslides. And then on the, on the left, we have the structural features, landslide scarps, levees, uh, faults, rift zone axes. Um, and then just some kind of a more easier to look at examples. This is one of the seamounts, the summit of it. Um, this is uh, commonly these uh, edge is kind of an important thing. These can be um, the result of sea level changes um, or they can just be part of a vol volcanic edge um, and where the thing levels off. Um, and then volcanic cones of various types. These have kind of, this one has a uh, depression in the middle and these are these other pancake cones, they call them, or flat top volcanic cones that erupt on the flat top summit. So those are the kind of things we map. We also use a slope map so we can uh, convert the bathymetry data into a slope representation that tells us um, how, what the, what the angles are of it. So the, the purples or the blues or the lower slope areas and the redder, yellow, orange areas are higher slope, um, higher slope, steeper. And that can help in our interpretations uh, too. And then we can layer this stuff on top of each other. We use these different, um, we use these different uh, outlines, these polygons, these are the geological units and these um, labels are what we use to um, call kind of abbreviations for the geological units. And then these lines, red lines with the, the dashed in the middle are um, what we're interpreting as uh, rift zone ridges. So these are where the magma plumbing goes. It's kind of like the lower east, east rift zone on Kilauea that it was erupting um, over the past year. That's what these rift zone, uh, these areas represent where the magma would have Is this a special gone. place or just a map that was just made? This is just one of the seamounts that we mapped. This one called Pure Ponce. So I'm just kind of picking this one as one of the um, one of the um, sea mountains or sea mounts to show you is uh, the way we do it. Um, and then this is uh, more of the detail, how we get in and what we can interpret from looking at the maps in detail. So these, this, all these uh, kind of blobby features on the top or, or these volcanic cones I mentioned and um, volcanic flank to the sides uh, on these rift zone areas and, and kind of debris flank and landslide areas off to the side. And this is just a summit of one of these seamounts. Um, and one of the other larger seamounts um, is pretty interesting. It had three different levels and we think it's composed of three different uh, volcanoes, one, two, and three, and maybe there's a couple actually underneath here. Um, and this is the profile. Uh, this line here is this profile line across the top um, and shows the various depths. So this is in the 14, 1500 meter deep range. Um, and then down here about, so it's like about a, um, about a mile deep. And then in here about 2000 meters deep and down here, I think about 2,400 meters or something like that. Do all these colorings? Um, yeah, this is all done, um, uh, on the computer. So we, we assign those color palettes to help you, your mind, um, see, see it. it. Yeah. Otherwise it's just a flat contour yeah. map. Yeah. Wonderful. They used to draw these, actually, even when I started grad school, they used to actually have drafts people. We <laughs> draw these things by hand, and then actually they would color them by hand. And then computers came about, so, <laughs> and software. So we don't do that anymore. We don't, we don't actually print maps much anymore. It's all done, everything's on the computer pretty much. And then these are some other examples, uh, getting into more detail. The, using the same eight units, but um, you can see how you can, I don't, you don't need to pick out the details of this, but you can see how the, you can, are able to, with this higher resolution data, how you can differentiate between the different units. And then these red lines are these different um, volcanoes within the seamount is what we uh, interpret it as. So um, three different seamounts um, based on the um, platforms and the rift zones. And um, the, uh, the shallowest one, this down in here, which I mentioned may actually cover another seamount. We're not quite sure about that. Um, and then just a third, the other, oops, sorry, the other uh, seamount, um, this one Edmondson, composed of about uh, three or uh, four or five, maybe even, uh, different volcanoes uh, that erupted at different times, and there are different levels 
Um, so this is kind of um, not as big as the Big Island, but it's the same idea where the Big Island's got like five volcanoes that are um, on it. This one's got about four at least um, that we've been able to interpret from the uh, mapping data. And um, the, the interesting thing is this one large one here doesn't have a flat top, which some of these others do. So a little bit different. And then just as a summary, um, we are able to kind of as for the whole um, region, that sub-region of the, of the monument, we are able to kind of tell um, a number of things, the multiple periods of volcanic growth, um, you know, on these several seamounts that we mapped. Um, different, um, these monogenetic cones mean they're erupt one time, that's like Diamond Head here and Cocoa Head, um, Cocoa Crater and um, Punch Bowl, they're, they only erupt one time, they come in later um, after the main thrust of volcanism that builds the island or the seamount. Um, and so they uh, kind of a complex, they're not just a simple mountain with one eruptive vent, they've composed of numerous um, different um, volcanoes within the same seamount. So what our data, the purpose of our data and what we thought was important to actually do this mapping study was that we knew there were um, follow-on cruises coming with the NOAA ship, the Okeanos Explorer and the ROV. So it's basically like if you're gonna take a road trip, uh, say the Grand Canyon, you know, in the uh, previous days you'd go get a map and look at, now you kind of go to Google Earth or something like that and look, but you need, you pretty much need a map to plan your plan out where you want to go. And the same is with science. We need to see where we're going before we do more detailed studies. ROV, so that's a uh, remotely operated vehicle. Robotic submersible. So we have manned submersibles where people go in and then robotic ones that are a tethered with a with an electromechanical cable, basically a wire. And then we also have autonomous vehicles that just go down, they're pre-programmed. And um, those are a little more limited on what you can do, but they're very good for mapping in high resolution. Um, so this uh, capstone program, this was 15 to 2017 by NOAA, and they studied um, all the marine monuments, all the US marine monuments in the Pacific. Um, in the uh, central to western Pacific. And they, they, as I mentioned, they spent, I think, three or four cruises at Johnson Atoll area. So they used the ship, uh, Okeanos Explorer, and then this ROV, the robotic vehicle. And then they, uh, there's a, a second vehicle that kind of sits above it. So it's able to see the other vehicle and light up. Uh, and it, it doesn't move around a lot. This one doesn't move around a lot. This one actually has manipulator arms, so the mechanical arms that can collect samples. So um, this, is a, this is the Johnson Atoll area again um, in here in the, the big, uh, the 200 mile radius, um, 400 mile diameter uh, area. And this, all these dots are the different dives that were done um, before and after our mapping crews. So um, the one, the map, the seamounts we mapped were down in this area um, on the Falcor cruise and the Okeanos came and dive, dove on some of those and mapped some additional ones. Um, dive on. So once we were finished with all this and the data were processed, all these data are um, uploaded to the um, internet and you can actually, anybody, public, anybody, scientists, kids, um, as long as you have an internet connection, you can go and download you know, these data. Um, knowing what to do with it is, uh, or being able to handle it is, is a different matter. There's um, a lot of, uh, it's a lot of, very voluminous. There's a lot of data there, uh, especially when you're talking video and some of this mapping data. So as an example of, instead of just showing you the maps, these are some of the um, critters that live on these areas. Um, all kinds of things, you have um, um, these sea stars, you have other echinoderms, you have um, uh, fish, these deep sea fish, you have deep sea corals, you have deep sea sponges, um, and they live in all these environments at very, uh, in very dark um, and cold one depths. One Which one? one? This one? No, the right. 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 Yeah, that. I don't know, Janie. Do you know? What that is? Is that? I can't see the disease. I can't. It looks like an anemone. Like a, I think it's a anemone. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's one of the, the very mm -hmm. almost translucent. Spiny. Yeah. yeah. So she knows. Thank Janie you. and I are used to work together until she oh. retired. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of weird stuff down there, and then. Um, Besides the individual animals, I mentioned earlier these high-density um, 
these high density com biologic communities. Um, basically, that's, I mean, you can see what they are there. So they have actually standards for them or something like 3,000 organisms um, uh, sighted per one kilometer of track, how long they do. But anyway, there's, these are all, um, in this case, deep sea corals. We have more corals and some sponges. Sponges here, more corals, corals and, and mostly corals in here. So it actually, these things get so dense that um, you can have a hard time seeing the seafloor. And there's all these associates um, or uh, other animals that live in and amongst and on these um, deep sea corals and sponges that you can't really see here. Where's this Papahanaumoku Achaeus? I've never heard of that. That's the northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Do you have a question? Yes. Do you take evidence of mutation with the sea life from the, uh, all the radiation that was going on there? Um, no, we didn't, they, they did, so we didn't really do enough um, work on these cruises to kind of look at that. Um, and they did a few dives around um, Johnson, Johnson Atoll itself, the actual atoll, but not, nothing that we could really think, look at there. The stuff they did previously was, um, I think they were looking at munitions sites, but um, that was done before my time. So. Um, so these summits of some of the, these seamounts um, have these thick cobalt-rich manganese crusts or cobalt-rich ferromanganese, iron manganese crusts, or I just call them polymetallic crusts, which um, means that poly is many, so they made up of many types of metals. Uh, so these are these crusts. I'll, I have one here. Um, you can feel free to look at You can You can open it and touch it if you want, but I'd wash my hands afterwards. They have some kind of nasty stuff in them. Yeah, it's not going to kill you, but don't lick your fingers. <laughs> um, and so these crusts form, and they can be very thick. In this case, so this example is uh, this crust here. This is four centimeters. So uh, that crust is about four centimeters um, thick there. So it's over an inch thick. Yes? Are those crusts all during the volcanic activity? No, these are from, these are much later. They precipitate slowly out of seawater, like mil, millimeters per million years. Uh, and they form this, uh, this kind of, un, this, it's called a botryoidal texture. It means, uh, I think that's Greek for gra grape, grapey. So they look like grapes, kind of bulby, bulbous. You, uh, you can see on the back side of that rock, um, you can feel that it's kind of a, a bumpy surface. And, and they coat everything, uh, it coats everything. So it's really hard to tell what the rocks underneath are. They could be Lava, basalt, basalt lava, they could be carbonate, you know, fossil reef. And sometimes you can't tell when they get so thick, it's very difficult. Um, so, but they have a lot of um, uh, strategic and uh, valuable metals in them. So this is a, a graph of the uh, enrichment of these uh, elements versus uh, regular Earth's crust. So just to, this is all, and these are most of the elements on the periodic table of elements. And the red ones here are cobalt, nickel, uh, copper, or the red. So they're very much more enriched in, um, than their uh, typical Earth's crust. So those are um, valuable metals. But there's also some of these other kind of nasty things like um, tellurium, uh, bismuth, arsenic. Uh, there's tungsten there, cadmium, boron. Uh, and then manganese, of course, is over here too. That's, where they, that's one reason they call it manganese because it's very enriched. Um, so there's a lot of these metals that are valuable just to be metals. There's also things that are um, um, that are only found in places that are uh, maybe not politically stable, other countries, that, depending on when, when that is. Um, so anyway, we've uh, my colleague Chris Kelly and his team, um, and actually Janie has worked on this kind of thing in the past, have um, gone through all these dives and they've logged all this stuff. So they actually logged this in spreadsheets and put it into a database. And they found that these, um, where these creatures um, prefer living so and or attaching to. So the, there's some these deep sea corals and sponges. And by far, they actually like living on this bedrock, the solidified surfaces. And, and even if it's this um, manganese crust, that's um, what well, it seems like it would be toxic. They, they, um, they don't seem to care. They just like to live on somewhere stable that they can grab onto and not get knocked over. Um, so what's 
what's the problem with that? Well, in this, these are all the marine monuments again that I mentioned earlier, or some of the, U the territories, um, the U.S. territories. In, the ca in this case, these black ones and the green ones are the, uh, the marine monument boundaries. This red line is the uh, what's called the prime crust zone. So that's been mapped out by, uh, that was established by a, a Jim Hine, a scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey some years ago. And that's based on that this area is where the thickest cobalt crusts or polymetallic crusts are found. And these are all, all these bumps are all these seamounts all around the Pacific. So you can see a lot of these monuments, uh, including um, Hawaii, the main islands, are all found in this red outline. So this area would be potential um, seafloor mining territory, except for the protected areas, which are the, the green, the monuments. But our, our point is we're trying to use these um, this kind of natural labs to find out what's down there um, as far as the biology and the, the geology and what they like to live on and where they are to help guide any future exploitation of the seafloor, trying to get ahead of that somewhat. Um, so in summary, a few, what, what we found is that these high density communities are found on these um, high points, these topographic crests like rift zone ridges, these sharp areas like down in here, there's a, um, you're pointing some out, and to a lesser extent on the flat tops of these, uh, some of these seamounts. Um, so the, the, um, the crests are these sharp edges there as you can imagine they have less sediment so it allows more of this exposed bedrock to be to be um, attached to by these organisms and that's where they they like to live they also are able to we we um they're still kind of working on proving this but it's um kind of the um, evidence that we've seen is that they like it there too because they all orient into the prevailing uh, currents their filter feeders so if they orient on these sharp uh, areas where the currents accelerate, um, they're able to gain more food that flows by because the water flow is faster. So they, they can't move, like they can't move around like whales and uh, you know go collect plankton and so on. So they have to be in a place where it comes by them. And so the other interesting thing is so far, they haven't found any of these communities except for one place at uh, below 2,600 meters. So that's um, kind of a key observation to date, and that's held up so far over the years. Um, so some, if we were um, kind of proposing uh, what should and shouldn't be exploited, um, this is uh, before the high-res mapping. This is kind of like you, this is your Google Earth image of um, the data, and this is what we've done with the sonar data, so we can get a lot more detail and um, actually get the correct depth ranges as well as all the detail out of it. Um, so we'd also um, consider, uh, recommend to restrict mining on the flat top, uh, to the restrict mining on the flat top seamounts that have well-defined rift zones and uh, summit cones where the corals and sponges are found until we can actually uh, sur survey them in the detail that I've shown you. Um, and then also uh, restricting the, the mining to deeper than 2,600 meters based on what's been found. So that might not be too popular because the deeper you go, the more difficult it is to um, send vehicles down there to do that. Um, so some of these vehicles have already been built, um, though they haven't been used yet. Um, these are what we call, uh, some of these are actual, some of these are computer uh, mock-ups and some of these are actual, these are the actual vehicles that have been built by Nautilus Minerals um, to do um, polymetallic sulfide mining, which is a little bit different than what I'm talking about. It's basically seafloor strip mining. Um, but um, this is actually from a year ago. Um, they put out a press release that uh, said they had tested this in a, in a, um, a quarry on Papua New Guinea, which is where they want to mine offshore first. They have an agreement with Papua New Guinea to do this. Um, and so they did this. I guess they flooded this mine, uh, I mean, sorry, this quarry, um, and then tested this vehicle. Of course, um, then two days later, um, this uh, local news outlet came out and said that they're deceiving. This isn't really going to work because they're actually going to run these things at a mile deep, and, and um, there's uh, no idea that these can actually work. So today I was actually looking around on the internet, trying to figure out what the next, what's, what the latest is, and I really didn't find anything new. Um, so I'm, I was told by a colleague that works kind of in this, in this, in this business that um, 
in the on the research end of it at least um, that they haven't knowledge really hasn't done anything um, along those lines yet so um, that's basically um, the end of what I had to talk about and I was um, going to show you the one video um, Hmm? There. Top left. Top left. Ah. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. This me? Yeah. So this is from the um, ROV, um, from one of the seamounts in Johnson Atoll. Look at this. This is amazing. If we could just hold the scene for a moment. These are sponges. This is the tech of the sponges here. You wanted sponges, Chris. Yeah, I got them. Yeah, that's, well, okay, I got them. Wow. The, the, the great thing about this, my love, is all of them. They're all very different. This one looks like a puppet. That's why sometimes they eat these sponges. When you come up and get something like this, you think you're on a different planet. It's so strange. Wow. It goes on and on, too. Every time we, we do these dives, all I think about is, you know, this is the type of experience someone would have if they found like life on another planet. You know, you know everything's so alien to at least for me. Even though I've been doing it for five years, it's still like on another planet down here. Yeah, and it's definitely the same for me as well, pilot. Because even though I work on these sponges, a scene like this is just extraordinary. And I'll toss my head in the ring, too. That's the uh, that crust over top of lava rock. So it's like coating it all. Here. Makes it very difficult to interpret what it is sometimes. <laughs> so. Yeah. So, if you have any questions, take question. Sure. Uh, yeah, I assume you spent most of your time on the ship. How much time did you actually spend? How much time did you actually spend on the atoll? And tell us something about the contamination level, whether it's chemical or radiation. Um. So, it, as far as uh, we don't. Um, on my cruise, we never went on the atoll. We just kind of saw it from I don't, a distance at one point. So it was all mapping. Yeah, it's all offshore stuff. So we didn't even really get close. Um, we did some surveying kind of close to there. Did that anybody warn the ship of any radiation problem? No, because we're, um, I, th I think that's um, not an issue unless you go on to the, onto the land part. So we were well off. There. Okay. Yes. I want to say mahalo piha because a lot of these words I never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. When you mentioned, when you mentioned the maybe not issuing permits except for the 2600 meters, it sounded like you were saying to do that to protect the life in the shallow water. Is that correct? Yeah, the, um, because we've. We had we we've only seen the high density communities down to that depth. Um, yeah. Now, our, the, it's a little bit maybe biased because we didn't do as many dives deeper because um, what a lot of the the community of scientists wanted to look at, they kind of picked these dive sites um, as a community. So that there was more interest in looking at things above that range. But we did do deeper dives. We just didn't do as many. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit biased. So actually, you know, like we always say, more work is necessary to get a better idea. Has as much detailed work been done in the main Hawaiian Islands and Northwest Hawaiian Islands as you described here for Johnston area? Um, more, 
yeah. So um, actually, I, when I was here a year and a half ago, I talked a little bit about this one, and then also about the Papa Hanalmo Kuke, the Northwest. And um, yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> but uh, that's um, we've been mapping there for. I've been there going up there since the year 2000, I think, and it's getting done thanks to the Schmidt Ocean Group. They sponsored two um, five-week cruises up there about five years ago that we went on, and then the main islands is. We mapped pretty much all of it. There's little gaps here and there. But, um, that's, and I put that data together too. So, where are you going next? Um, so in a week and a half, I'm going. Um, where am I going? <laughs> <laughs> down to the southeast on the uh, down to the. So instead of that crust thing, it's a the manganese nodule area, which. Um, That's these. <laughs> so they're the same idea, only they're round, kind of round, and they precipitate, uh, but they they stay on top of the seafloor. So I'm going with uh, on our research ship Kilo Moana. Uh, it's a charter by the um, Korean um, group that is has a lease block down there. So they um, we go down and do these. Right now, it's not mining; it's environmental studies, engineering studies, abundance studies. So they have to do all these uh, basically environmental work before mining commences. And then I think during mining and then afterwards, you have to do this too. So the, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Germans, the Belgians, uh, and then like a consortium of um, some British or all and others are, uh, and then I think the Chinese what are. Areas this, is? this is called the Clarion Clipperton zone. It's, um, it's, if, if you go, it's about a thousand miles south of us, halfway to the equator, so it's about 10 degrees north. We're at 21 right here. Um, so it's about a thousand miles down, and then the, the least blocks stretch from south of Hawaii all the way to the west coast, like off Baja. And um, it's, uh, it's an area that's extremely rich in, in these nodules for a variety of reasons which aren't fully understood, <laughs> but um, that's where, um, or the first mining will actually probably happen. And I had a, this colleague I mentioned was just here um, a few weeks ago. She was out with the Belgians um, last year, and they they actually are testing a vehicle now. It's a small scale, and then they're going to test a bigger one this time. And then it's not the full size thing, but they're actually testing a vehicle to see if it can collect nodules down there, um, or if it can even move down there, because the sediment down there is very soupy, kind of very soft. And then, yeah. Nan, did you have a um, question? Oh, a couple. So, if it's very soupy, is it what's the visibility like? Uh, well, the visibility is very good because there's not, um, there's not, as long as you don't disturb it. Oh. Sure. But the, the <laughs> sediment is very soft, so you can imagine when they start scooping stuff up, you're going to yeah. lose, wow. and then you're going to have the plume. Um, besides destroying any life there, you're going to have a plume of sediment. So that that's all being looked at. And actually, in I think two weeks, Craig Smith yeah. from our department is going to be here, and he's specifically going to talk to you about that. And he's he's a biologist, and um, he's a little more, he's got a different, um, you know, take on it. So I, if you want to, if you're more interested in that, he's going to be talking about that in that area, that clarion Clipperton zone, I think. So. Um, when, you, when they destroyed the Agent Orange, they... Burned it up. And what happened? Like, I think fumes or something that like there had to be some residue. Or something. Yeah, well, I remember because I was I was living here then, and I remember there was concern about the way that air currents were blowing, and that would we get because they were burning nerve agent. Nerve, yeah, yeah. And I I didn't know at the time they were doing Agent Orange. I assumed they were burning everything, and so I guess I don't know what their protocol was if they had to. Monitor the winds. So I think up there in the universe somewhere. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Raining down on this somehow. I mean, it's a long ways away, but um, you know, <laughs> but and the trades tend to blow around. from the northeast to the you know southwest. So hopefully it was okay. <laughs> <laughs>